Hello and welcome. Thank you for coming to today's Atticus Advantage webinar, Lessons Learned by the Practice Growth Masters. My name is Mike Wells and I'll be uh, handling the behind the scenes work here today. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about Atticus first before we get to our speakers. Atticus was founded in 1989 to provide in-depth ongoing support and accountability programs for attorneys that help you increase your revenues and your personal income, reduce your stress, and the number of hours you spend in the office. We're looking to give you greater sense of satisfaction with your career so that you can have more time with your loved ones and your personal interests. If you've ever attended an Atticus workshop or a webinar and later, you re later realize you could benefit from further help implementing some changes in your practice, then the very best the thing you can do to accomplish on those goals is to see if you qualify for enrollment in our practice growth program, which meets quarterly for two days. If you're unsure if a group program is the right solution for you, we highly recommend that you talk to us about a pra practice growth diagnostic to determine your individual course of action. Uh, if you want more information about either of these, you can contact us at hello at atticusadvantage.com. So a couple of logistical items. If you need to ask a question uh, during today's broadcast, you can use the chat function on your GoToWebinar dashboard, and you'll send a message to the organizer, that's me. If you'd like that question to remain anonymous, indicate so in your message so that I don't read your name aloud. You can also click the hand icon on the dashboard to indicate you have a question or comment. And at the end of this session, we'll have a question and answer session and we'll call on you. And when we do, we'll unmute you so that you can be heard by the group. Today's uh, uh, presenter is Steve Riley. He is a, a, a shareholder in Atticus. He's a, a practicing attorney who has built and sold his own practice. He works exclusively with a limited number of, of attorneys on a one-on-one -on -one coaching basis across the country. He also teaches in a number of our programs. And he's also a published author. So without further ado, I'd like to hand this over to you, Steve, if you'd like to continue and talk about uh, today's session and introduce our guest. Well, that'd be terrific. So thanks, Mike. So uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, today is the purpose of the lessons from the Practice Growth Masters is to give you, the attorney, the opportunity to learn from someone who had done either something very innovative um, or had done a tremendous job implementing some of the things they've learned working with us or have just done some really creative things in moving their practice forward. And so it's one of my favorite things to get to do because I get to talk to some of the best, in my opinion, some of the best lawyers in the country when it comes to running and growing a practice. Now, one of the big distinctions here is that we're not going to focus on the lawyer's legal expertise, like, you know, we're not going to talk about legal technical issues. We're really going to focus on the business side of the practice. So today, we're really going to hit three things. Number one, we're going to take lessons from the Practice Growth Masters, which in this case, we're going to introduce uh, one of my favorite clients and a longtime friend, Joe Siegel, who is going to, and I'll give him a more formal introduction in a moment, and talk you know, set him up so you can understand where he was at when he started his practice, where he grew his practice. And while we can't, we only have about an hour together with Joe, and he's taking time out of an intensive uh, schedule, uh, we don't have a time to take apart everything he's done, but he's going to share with us four or five key strategies that has allowed him to move his practice uh, forward to, to really be more of the practice that he wants in his mind, his dream practice. Uh, we're going to talk for a few minutes about how Atticus programs work. This series is really designed to help you look at what would, what could we do as a company to help you move your practice forward. And then third, uh, I always end with the most important recommendation out of this particular call, or out of this series of calls. So those are really the three uh, topics. With that, let me introduce Joe uh, to you. So Joe... Um, I asked Joe before the program started, is there uh, anything you don't want me to ask you? And he said, no, no, I'm an open book. Ask me anything. So everything's fair for me today. Joe already put that on the table. But Joe um, is a very successful um, real estate practitioner, but that's not fair to him to look at some of the things that he's done from an innovation perspective, which we're going to spend some time on. Uh, Joe really opened his practice back in 2004 and has grown it tremendously. He and his partner, Philip, have done a tremendous job. And he's really 
done a very interest a couple of very interesting things in this practice I want to make sure I talk about. So before we go further, um, let me just do this. Joe, welcome to the call. Thank you. And how are you doing, man? Are you ready? Are you ready to go to work with us? Can't wait. Uh, this afternoon, can't wait. So when you started your practice back in '04, and you just kind of started it, um, what was it like? What was your practice like? Could you? Uh, you know, how many employees did you have? What was it like for you? Where were you, you know, where, what was a typical day like for you? Well, I, I sort of hit the ground running because in 2004 when I opened, the, the real estate market in Florida was booming. Um, that was the beginning of the bubbles. And uh, I uh, quickly hired my mom uh, who flew down from North Carolina and spent a couple of weeks with me uh, just to answer phones and faxes. Yes, we still had faxes back then. Um, and then I hired a, a receptionist slash assistant who uh, I would now say that I had adopted her. Uh, looking back on it at the time, I thought I was just giving her a, a lot of chances. Um, and then slowly, uh, quickly actually, by 2005, I had grown in 1,500 square feet. Um, I think I had 10 employees crammed in there. Um, sitting on top of each other and then uh, by the time we moved out in 2007 into our own building of 3,000 square feet we had uh, close to 20 employees um, so I, I was running like a chicken with my head cut off when I first opened in 2004 it, it was a madhouse it was crazy were you getting a lot of time off then no no I, I prided myself on answering clients emails at uh, you know midnight one two in the morning uh, you know you stay up till two or three in the morning you get back up at six or seven and go at it again and Saturdays and Sundays are times that you you know if you're not running to Costco buying drinks and snacks for the office you're you're in the office or you're sitting at home reviewing documents or drafting documents or again returning emails and so you, you even on holidays um, I remember, you know, going to my parents' house on Thanksgiving, and you're sitting there with your laptop, still, you know, going as hard as you can go, even on Thanksgiving Day and and and, and any holidays. It was it was just you worked, 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 and that's supposed. And and and, and I, I did make a lot of money. I was making good money, but um, I had no life, uh, no no real social life, no real. Uh, uh, family home life either it was pretty bad and so what where were you or what was going on when you reached out to start working with Atticus like what what happened there because you you're working you're not taking any time off you're working you know 14 16 hour days you're working seven days a week and most lawyers think that's like a, a badge of success um, not realizing that might lead them to burnout or exhaustion, and they're thinking that you know that's a really good life right there. That's a good practice. What happened? Well, well, uh, the bubble burst. Uh, we went. I remember in 2006. A lot of people think that the recession started in 2007, but it really started in 2006. Um, August 2006, we went from doing about 100 closings a month to 10. Uh, in August and I said well it's just a slow time it's going to come back and then we went from 10 we went to 3, 2, they were canceling. I'd opened uh, two other satellite offices uh, in various parts of the area, Central Florida um, and I had to go in one day uh, and finally I made it to 2007. In 2007 I laid off in one day 70 percent of my staff um, and that's wow. the, that's the saddest day of my life where you're from work life. So I say my work life where you're sitting there looking at these people across the table who have done absolutely nothing wrong. You know they've worked as hard as they can, and you have to tell them I can't keep you because I just don't have the work for you. And so I I, I started sort of grasping. Um, at anything I could. I, I, I was reading books on management and marketing. I, I read about the Disney way. I still like the Disney way, don't get me wrong. Um, <laughs> you know, I, 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 was, I was doing all kinds of just grasping at straws. And then I remembered um, 
Mark, a meeting Mark Powers uh, at a conference I was at one time, and uh, I said, well, you know, he said that he his job is to make law, uh, lawyers' jobs better, uh, lives better, lawyers' lives better, and um, so I thought, okay, well, let me look into this and see what's there, and I think I was still getting some emails at the time from Atticus, so um, I signed up for the Rainmakers program, and that's how I first... I, I felt it's like okay, I've got some structure here. Now let's start moving forward again. What, how are we going to do it? So. Well, that's interesting. So the Rainmakers program focuses on time management and light marketing, and you know, like how to do referral-based marketing really starts opening up the doors for marketing. Because if you've got four cornerstones for growth, you got the rain, you've got the client development, you've got time management, you know, cash flow and profitability, and hiring and staffing. And the Rainmakers really focuses on two. So when you start the Rainmakers program, what happened next? Did that work for you? Um, well, looking back on it, I mean, we Rainmakers was sort of like, I mean, yeah, it worked. It, it got me, at least got some structure to my thinking um, as far as, okay, okay these are, this is a plan of action that you can take step by step to at least manage your time and think about, you know, consistently marketing. Um, and it gave terms to, to a ways of thinking, top of mind awareness, you know, things like that. Referral-based marketing, things I'd never even heard of. Um, laser talk. So um, it, it, it gave me that, but Cami, our, our coach, she's talked about it before. She said to me, that's sort of like you've got a gym membership and you go to the gym. And it's great because you're at least, you're, you're moving forward. You are getting getting there. Um, and after after Rainmakers, um, for about a year of doing that, I felt like okay, I've I've gone, I've done as much as I can do here, and I feel like I'm just, now I'm just sort of in a rut. And so now, what can I do next? And then that was the next program, the what is it, the day and a half uh, program? I forget what it's called, Practice Builder, Practice Growth. Um, yeah, it's it's now morphed into the the first day and a half of the Practice Growth program. But so you went to the first, you went to a day and a half workshop. Right, and, and that it. totally changed everything. That, that totally changed everything from that point on. And, and why did that change everything for you? Like, what what was the key difference for you with that? When you say it changed everything, what happened? Did your, you know, did your well, thinking change? You know, what what occurred? It it, it then, that then gave me structure of okay, here's your pipeline of how you get cases in. And I totally, I had always been just a transactional guy and it and it totally changed me to say okay well you can do litigation you can do other work but you'll just have to bring in other lawyers and paralegals it taught us uh, how to make more money by hiring people uh, who aren't related to you in any way familially <laughs> um, <laughs> hiring complete strangers um, you know to and, and then leveraging them to to crank out more work and thus more uh, uh, invoices uh, and, and get more payments back than you can ever do on your own. And um, so, it, it, and it, and, and it uh, at, yeah, I, I remember coming home and telling Philip, I said, okay, well, I'm going to be taking off. I won't be working on weekends anymore. No more working on holidays, and we're going to take vacations again. <laughs> and he said, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a it was a complete mind shift after that first day and a half right there. Um, the first day, I felt like I had been beaten with a stick. Um, I felt like oh this is just a bunch of hooey. But by the end of the the second day, um, I it's, yeah you drink you you drink the Kool Aid and you go okay now this is okay so this is how this can work this it does make sense. And as a lawyer, things have to make sense to you, and Atticus helps it make sense. Well, it's interesting. So I'm, I'm listening. I'm listening to you, and I, I think probably one of the most interesting things about uh, the practice builder um, in that process is um, the you know, everyone comes in and they're pretty much the same mindset about it. They're coming in and so this is a bunch of hooey, you know, this is a bunch of voodoo, this is this is a bunch of rah rah BS. And somewhere in the process, either it's a shift in you know, it's a shift in thinking or they get confidence and they start to uh, 
think differently about the practice and they start to act differently about the practice. And for a lot of lawyers, it becomes kind of uh, the demarcation point for them. Like they know that that was a, a decision point that they were going to move their practice differently. So uh, when was that? Do you recall when that was? The, it, it was the probably about the middle of that second day. I decided I, I got so energized, and I had, I mean, I'd let go of staff. We had moved into this new building that we had bought during the boom, and now we're moving in at the beginning of what we didn't realize was going to be a five-year bust. Um, I'd shut down two outer offices and just closed up and walked away from from leases that we had signed. I had a realtor offices going bankrupt, so I just I, I was just you know lower than a snake's belly. I was low, and but at the yeah. end of that second day, in the middle of that second day, it's sort of like this light goes on. You go, you know, I I can do this, and it doesn't depend on what a great lawyer I am. You know, I always thought, oh well, if I'm not board certified in real estate, I'm just worthless. I'll never. Uh, make lots of money. I'll never have time off. I'll always just be this, you know, trudging lawyer. And by the end of that second day, I realized like that has nothing to do with it. Clients don't care really, and it, most clients don't care about your certifications. Um, they do care a little bit about you know your experience and what you can tell them. But one of the things we've learned is, you know, by the end of the five years, you know about everything about the law in your area that you're going to know, and you're about as good a lawyer as you're going to be. After that, it's, how can you be a better businessman uh, or business That's woman? great. That's great. You could, I, I, um, I remember having a conversation with a lawyer who was double board certified who um, was complaining, you know, that he was having a difficult time getting paid and getting customers. And I called his firm, kind of like a mystery shopper, and I called his firm. And the experience for me as a prospective client was so bad that I was like, you know, you can be double board certified in the law, you know, in legal topics. But if you're not consciously aware of the customer service that you're providing to prospects, if you're not consciously aware of the customer service you're providing to clients, um, it don't matter. You know, if you're if you're not if your business skills aren't there, man, it don't matter. It, it doesn't. It really doesn't matter. So, what year was it that you took the practice builder? Oh God, was that 2007, 2008, maybe? Yeah, somewhere around there, 2007, 2008, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I believe that's accurate. I believe that's that's about right. So let's fast forward. We're we're sitting here, you know, almost 10 years later, and up on the screen are. Um, not only your law firm, but are also three other businesses that you have created. And I'd like you just to take a moment and talk about P your precision closing services. And I would like to take a moment to talk about timeshare and closemytimeshare.com because these are, these are two things that you really, I think, are very innovative and that you've created out of one of our upper level programs. So I'd like you, if it's okay with you, just take a moment or two just to kind of tell everybody kind of the about those businesses. Would that be okay with you? Yeah, sure. Um, well, of course, the law firm. I mean, that that was when I went off on my own in 2004. Um, and in Florida, it's very rare for people. Uh, realtors are not used to closing with lawyers. They they think lawyers screw things up and slow things down and kill deals. So they're used to closing with title agencies. Uh, and for many other issues, the title agency does work better. So I started the title agency in 2005 and, and shuttled all the closings and title insurance business through there. Um, when the crash hit, um, we looked at it, okay, well, how can we expand a little bit? And we thought, well, there's some refi business out there, refinancing. So let's look at getting licensed in other states. So we ended up... Uh, uh, my business partner <laughs> was licensed already uh, in other states to sell title insurance, and but the business just wasn't coming in. The refinance business wasn't there, so we looked around and said, "Well, what other business has, you know, multi-jurisdictional closings?" Um, and we said, "Well, timeshare resales. You know, people have their timeshare and they want to give it to their kids or they want to sell it, and that market there are not many licensed." 
title agencies, independent title agencies that do that. It's usually the large underwriters do it. So we said, okay, well, let's come up gotcha. with PCS Holdings, which we later changed to CloseMyTimeShare.com. And over time, we got a client uh, who, um, a developer client, who said, here, you guys just handle all of our owner-to-owner -owner transfers every month. So it's about 800 of them a month, 800 closings a month. Uh, and so we went to them and said, you know, guys, it would be much easier if we didn't have to fax or, or email or, or, or mail this paperwork back and forth to all these people all over the country uh, or all over the world in some cases for their closings. So can we, you know, put it online? And they said, well, no, not yet. So we said, well, we don't care. We're going to put it online for ourselves just to make it easier for us to track what's going on. So we came up with this, slowly developed this cloud-based um, process um, so that uh, we could at least input everything in in a cloud-based system and produce the documents and kick them out and track everything as it moved through the system. Because 800 closings a month, that's, that's a lot of paperwork, a lot of people to keep happy and also keep them up to date on what's going on. At that point, we were still dealing with phone calls of people calling, did you get this, did you get this, did you get this? So finally, we convinced the client after about a year of them we opened it up to them next and said, here, you guys can just go in to our dashboards and see what's going on. And they fell in love with it. And, they, and so we said, okay, fine. Can we now open it up directly to the consumers, uh, your consumers? And they said, sure, go for it. So we did it. And we realized that this is not just something that they can use, but we could use it with everything else. So it expanded. And Timeshare Pro Plus expanded into this, this you know, Sort of, there are multiple cloud-based modules to it now. It's it's we hold escrow. We have one called uh, holdmyescrow.com. We have one called requestmyestoppel.com for homeowners associations to use, uh, timeshare owners associations to use to for people to go in online and request uh, their condo estoppel. We we uh, uh, did the owner to owner where uh, you can uh, go in, enter your information, and we get it or we can license it to other title agencies or law firms and they can use it and people can go in and order and their their deeds or whatever they need. Um, another module is, um, oh gosh, we got, uh, Jiffy Docs. Uh, Jiffy Docs, a lot of uh, realtors who are, who handle timeshare resales, they were, uh, the way they were doing their contracts was crazy. So we developed a, a module that their documents are online. All they got to do is go and fill in the information and it'll produce the documents, send them out. The people can docu-sign them, echo-sign them, whatever, electronically, and they come back within seconds. Um, and they, they don't have to worry about pulling up a Word document and changing them over and over. You know, things that we've done in law for years, realtors, right. uh, timeshare realtors haven't done. Um, well, so so but it's this sort is, of grown. I'm, yeah, so this is really important. So those of you that are trying, you know, are paying attention and listening, um, you know, there are a couple things that Joe did here that I just want to highlight that were very that were very brilliant. <laughs> uh, first and foremost was when the rest of the market was zigging, he zagged. So while the rest of the market, the real estate market, was batting down, you actually took a step back and said, okay, what do we have that's unique? that our competitors don't have and how can we sell that? And first off, it was the multi-licensing capability, multi-jurisdictional practice. The second thing that you did, which was really important, and it's one of the things that I see a lot of lawyers that are doing innovative work that you're doing, um, is that sometimes lawyers um, drive right past the simple opportunities to innovate. So when you develop the the timeshare pro process, you you really pitched the client on it and really got the client to buy in and then over time improved it, paid for it, and then rolled it out to the customer, you know, to consumers at large, um, which was very important. So, I mean, a lot of lawyers, sometimes they have a tendency to go, you know, for the home run versus getting on base. So it's one of the things that you've done very well and you've done strategically. Um, when you were going through that process, and, and I love the Jiffy Docs thing, by the way, I love that. Um, when you were going through that process, uh, what what was the fuel for that? I, I know that it was, you know, the timeshare work has to be low margin. It's got to be complicated. 
it's got to be um, aggravating. But what would the when did you connect the dots and say, you know, what I need to do is do a cloud-based process on this? What was the what was the muse, the inspiration for this for you? Well, my business partner was sitting around and and we were just sort of talking one day, and he said, you know, if we didn't have to, well, we talked about our postage bills, our UPS bill. Um, which was running thousands of dollars a month. Um, and then the biggest complaints we were getting was just how long the process was taking. Um, when we took over that project from the client that they were trying to do in-house, they were already two years behind on everything. And uh, when we got everything caught up, they said, okay, fine, we'll just bring it all back in-house. Um, and within a few months, they were already, we'd heard, nine months behind again within three months. <laughs> They'd fallen behind. It was, it was wow. crazy. We're like, how did you guys fall nine months behind in three months? I don't get this. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but yeah, we, we just started looking at things. But listening, you know, uh, to, to him, I mean, my business partner sitting there saying, how can we do it? And, I'm, and I, I just go, well, why can't we just put it all on the web and run it on a cloud-based system and just, you know, you know what I should have said was why can't we just throw a quarter of a million dollars out there and program something because that's basically what we ended up doing. You know, let's just burn through a quarter of a million dollars real quick. Um, but but by doing that, you know, by by taking the risk, by spending the money, uh, and by doing it, it, we 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 got something set up that solved a problem in the industry that um, and and any lawyer. I mean, we talked to estate planning lawyers, we talked to personal injury lawyers, um, uh, criminal defense lawyers all the time, and we hear them talk, it, just just listening to them, and we go, okay, well, there's a, a pain point for your client, your customer, or for yourselves. Why can't you develop something to fix that? You know, why can't you come up with something? And, you know, we've met other lawyers in Atticus who have come up with similar ideas in their practice areas and it seems that we all sort of take that same tack of or the track of first we're going to come up with it and we're going to try it out on ourselves and we're just going to you know hammer it to death for about it takes about a year at least to, to get it developed and work out the kinks uh, and then after you've done that then you can start saying well is there a market for this outside of me that I can just license this to people and put their name on it, put it on their website, um, do their mobile app where they can use it and it shows their name and then it just says powered by Timeshare Pro Plus um, down in the corner. So that's where we have ultimately gotten to uh, with that that innovation. Yeah, so you, you um, it's one of, the, one of the things, one of the standards that I look for for an innovation for lawyers is that when your customers and when your competitors start to become your customers then you know you're doing something very innovative in the marketplace because yeah. when your competitors look at you and go you know um, they do that so much better and so more uniquely than we do I wonder if we can license it or buy it from them and uh, that's when that's when you start to become what I would consider a, a market dominant player and a, and a game changer inside the legal industry it's something that you you've done brilliantly um, so let me. I mean, we're we're you've gone through a lot of evolutions. You're currently um, in the you know dominate your market program. Let me ask you this question. Um, and I'm going to you know so when everybody I'm heard a collective electronic gasp, and when you said you were doing 800 closings a month. Uh, from when you were doing 10, you know, in the when the market crashed. Let me ask you this question, and we'll have another collective gasp. And I, I know the number already because I asked you before the call. How many days off did you have last year? Oh, um, 146 last year. Okay, so, so this is important. So 10 years ago, we had no time off. We're working you know, every day of the week, basically, whether it's running to Costco or responding to email, and working horrible 16 days a week. And this year, you're... Last year, you had 146 days off. And so we'd say days off, uh, for our purposes of definition, that's no emails, no phone calls. There's 146 pure days off of just uh, having a good time, vacationing, you know, rejuvenating, resting, whatever it is that you want to do on that. Um, and I know a lot of lawyers, whenever I talk about time off, don't 
they don't believe me. They think it's you know it's a, a bunch of hooey and a bunch of BS. Um, what's the benefit to you as a business owner in taking that time off? What's the benefit to you? You have time to think. Um, and it's funny because Philip and I joke. I mean, we used to think about which fire we were going to be putting out on the weekends or or during hot. We used to think about you know uh, what client uh, or employee fire do we have dumpster fire do we have going that we need to deal with and how are we going to deal with that? And now it's you know if we're off. Well, if we're on a cruise, I mean, the, the picture is up right now. We're on a cruise in the Mediterranean. We don't talk business there um, usually uh, on cruises. But um, if it's just a weekend and we're sitting around, we'll go, oh, yeah, you know, what if we tried X, Y, and Z to get that guy's business? It. My time is still spent probably 70% on – um, being the captain of the ship and, you know, sort of charting the course of where it's going to go. The other 30% is spent down, you know, shoveling coal into the, the engines. Um, Philip, on the other hand, uh, spends really 100% of his time just charting the course for the ship to take. He he does not deal. He, he's got it even better than going running better than I do. That All he does is business development, business development. Um, so uh, and 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 it really took him, you know, out. Atticus took him from being an in-house counsel to being um, the head of a, a multi-state firm. Um, uh, that is, you know, that all he does is deal with employees, some, and um, trying to get more business, new business, um, and how they can more efficiently handle the business that they have. So yeah, it's so. Well it. It, 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 it's perfect. So let me ask you this question: If someone's listening today and they're like, "Oh my God, 146 days off," I would be happy with two weeks of no email, no phone calls, or my God, four weeks of no emails, no phone calls, or at least a couple of weekends off. Um, what were the three recommendations that you can make to them as someone who's walked the path of working every day, working? long hours, you know, fighting fires. If you say looking back over the past, quite frankly, almost a decade now, um, what were the three major strategies that you implemented that allowed you to set the foundation to be able to take time off? Well, well, first I want to say that we're actually disappointed in 146 days. Our goal was 176. So we were 30 days short. So we were disappointed in ourselves that we didn't get those other 30 days um, last year. But uh, the the first strategy um, I think was was studying Kaizen, uh, which we I think was one of the first books we ever got into in the dominate your market. And you know, little by little, you 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 break everything down to the smallest bite-sized piece that you can think of and and that's the small the first thing you're going to do um, so that was the the first thing you have to do you, you can't think of okay this is I'm gonna I need to take off 146 or 176 days a year you have to say I'm gonna start with I'm gonna try to take this weekend off and while I may see an email pop up on my phone because it's there I'm not going to respond to it I'm not as as you know, we say now there is no, you know, life or death emergency in real estate. It, nobody's going to die if I don't respond to this email this weekend or while I'm on vacation or whatever. Um, so that's you. You've got to figure out what's the smallest step you can take today that will move you toward that goal. The second strategy was learning um, about leveraging. Uh, and, and delegating um, to to your paralegals, to associates, uh, to legal assistants, and then um, inculcating that throughout your entire organization, so that your paralegal has the the authority to delegate to a legal assistant. A legal assistant has the the authority to delegate to an intern or a, or a clerk. So everybody has this you know, authority um, to delegate as well. 
because you don't want just you having the time off and having a good life. You want your, you know, one of the big things that I, I think all of our fellow dominate your market attorneys is they want their firms to not only improve their lives, but also to, to make the lives better for their employees as well as their clients. Um, so you have to have that, you know, that, that delegating mindset. And then the third strategy is hiring and firing uh, because to have people like that who you can delegate to um, confidently and have processes in place that you know that you have follow-up uh, and checks and balances to, to catch mistakes before they get through, to catch uh, misses before they're missed forever, um, you have to be able to hire good people and you have to be able to, to spot them and hire them. But not only that, but you have to be ready to fire as well quickly uh, if they're just not cutting it or they just don't fit into your um, uh, atmosphere of your, your firm. You've got to say, okay, you're just not a good fit for us. Your ladder is up against the wrong wall. You need to go somewhere else. So we're going to find somebody else. Um, fortunately, for the past few years, anyone we've hired is, knock on wood, um, been great um, because of what we've we've learned through Atticus about how to a, a good hiring process um, uh, uh, and everything else that goes along with then uh, onboarding that employee and then um, generating a training program for them and, and process maps and everything else so that they get better and better. As, uh, as as time goes on. So those are, I think, the three strategies. Kaizen, um, delegation, and then hiring and firing are the big three for yeah. us. That's perfect. So the Kai, yeah, so Kaizen is, um, for those of you that are um, following along and may not qualify for Dominate Your Market or Practice Growth Program, uh, Kaizen is a, a Japanese management philosophy on how to make small improvements uh, daily in your life or in your practice. There's quite a few books out there on it. Um, uh, the most recent, the one that jumps to my mind is uh, William, I think it's William Morrow's book, um, How one small, one small Change, One Small Step Can Change Your Life. And there's a couple others. If you're interested in the book that we recommend in Dominate Your Market, uh, which is a different one, just email Mike at the end of this webinar and we can send you the link to that and you can check out that book. Sure, Steve. It's the actually the, thing, the spirit of Kaizen. Um, but yeah, anybody that has a question about that or Kaizen. anything else during the, the webinar, you can email hello at atticusadvantage.com and we'll be happy to, to help you yeah. out. Yeah, if you're curious about the book, and the book is deceptively simple, but the it's like most books uh, in most of the things that we teach and recommend to folks. The difference, that, <laughs> the difference is that Joe applied it. So it's one thing to read a book. It's one thing to learn a new idea. It's one thing to learn a concept. But it's a radically different thing to actually apply it and, and change and, and take a risk and change. Um, the other thing that I really enjoyed that you said that I, I, I want to highlight and hopefully everybody got is if you want to have really great team and have a really great management structure, you've got to do two things really well. You've got to learn how to strategic dele strategically delegate and build profit centers, which you're talking about in strategy number two. And number three, you've got to be able to figure out um, that the secret to great managing is actually going setting up a great hiring process. So all three of those things are, are critical for growth in order for you to take the time off. So looking back, what, what do you think, I mean, because you, this was a bunch of hooey for you when you first looked at it, um, but looking back, and you're talking about a decade of hard work and transformation and, and changes, and, um, you know, looking back and assuming that you've got somebody on the phone today with us who's just like, man, they're their they're wits end, they're like, oh my God, you know, Joe, you don't understand, I'm in a family law practice, I'm working... 14 hours a week, I mean 14 hours a day, I'm working every day of the week. Um, my spouse is thinking about divorcing me because I'm a terrible spouse and I don't get to see my kids much and, you know, and I'm stressed out in my mind. Um, what would be the first change you'd recommend that they make? Well, and I, I don't just have to, that 
Yeah, I don't I don't just have this conversation with lawyers. I've had this conversation with doctors and pharmacists and uh, uh, CPAs, uh, uh, dentists, and I tell them, I go, well, first you've got to decide what you want out of life. I mean, if you want to be lying on your deathbed at 50 years old saying, boy, I wish I had just gotten that last uh, email out to that client before I took my last breath here, then sure, keep on keep on doing it. But at some point, you've got to say, okay, enough. And it's not going to be, it may be a spouse saying, that's it, you know, I'm done. I, I remember my doctor telling me one time that he was uh, coming into work that morning and his wife had written in lipstick on the, the mirror that if you don't cut down your hours, I'm leaving you. I said, well, what shade did she use? You know, but, um, <laughs> I, I, and, and he ended up, you know, it was his, his, his wife telling him she's had enough. So he ended up, he, he sold his practice and retired at 50. Um, and I don't think that made him happy. You know, I think you've got to first go, okay, I, I've had enough. And once you've reached that point, it's, it's sort of like an alcoholic you're a workaholic. You've got to say, you've got to make that decision. I've had enough. Then once you've made that decision, then you're ready to move forward. You're ready to start going, yeah. okay, what do I enjoy? And what will make my life more well-rounded and more complete that I will look back on on my deathbed and go, boy, I wish I'd spent more time in Greece. Or I wish I had done, I'd played more golf. Or I wish I had volunteered more hours uh, at the food bank, you know, whatever that may be for you, you've got to first decide, okay, I've had enough, now let me start designing my perfect life going forward. That's perfect, that's perfect, because I, I think, um, you know, for me, oh goodness, I've been working with lawyers off and on and trying to help them design what you consider a great life for 20 plus years and I think the two things that you've said are right on the money that I've heard over and over and over. One, they have to have enough pain where they go, okay, that's it, I, I can't, I, I, I have to change something. And they have to hit kind of an emotional rock bottom where they go, I, I have, this is painful enough. Because until then, they're the smart, they're smart people. They're like really smart, they're very successful in their own mind, but until they reach some kind of self-realization where they have to, have to admit to themselves there's something they don't know um, that they don't know about which might be you know the business side of the law it might be you know how to think about strategic delegation how to think about the financial side of the law there might be something they may be a tremendous trial lawyer but when it comes to selecting great staff there may be horrible and uh, you know until they can reach a self-realization and own that um, they're almost impossible to talk to because they can't see it. They don't get it. They're they're just impervious to the world. Um, you know, they're just they're the they're just the smartest creature they've ever met, and they're good looking too. And they they're just you know they just can't they they just it, they're just impossible. And so they have to get to a point where they're in enough pain where they go, okay, I can't take this anymore. And some younger ones, some younger ones are smart enough. They can look upstream and go, oh Lord, have mercy. I don't want to have that guy's life which was one of the reasons I left the first practice I was part of. I looked upstream, looked at the partners, and said, oh, uh, yeah, I don't want that. And so some of the younger lawyers are smart enough to go, there might be a different path than the traditional path to pain and suffering. The second thing is making a decision. You've got to decide, okay, this has got to change, and making a decision to make the change. So um, in a moment, I am going to open this up for people that want to have questions for you. And uh, I really appreciate you sharing and explaining kind of what your thought process is, the innovations that you've done. And I realize that we're highlighting just, you know, it's kind of like, it's like doing a comic book version of a masterwork of literature because the, the amount of work that you've done over that time period is so significant that most people don't, you know, there's some lessons that you've done, some things that you've you've gone through that you've no doubt forgotten about. But, you know, so it's not really fair to you or fair to the experiences. But I'm going to give people the opportunity to go, you know, to ask questions of you in a minute. 
Um, before they do that, I am going to make a couple of recommendations. So uh, what I'd like to do is just talk for a moment about what might be next for you as you listen to this before I give you an opportunity to talk to uh, Joe. Um, look, you know, you might be at a point in your life where you are like, you hear what Joe has to say, and you're like, you know, I'd like to take some of that action. I'd like to, I'd like to learn more about what to do with my practice and what I really perceive to be a more compelling, exciting future for myself. And to do that, all you have to do is make one simple decision, and that is really going to be um, uh, looking at your leadership and management skills. Uh, and really, I'm going to recommend that you consider doing what we consider call a practice growth uh, diagnostic. So uh, let me talk to you for a few minutes about the key elements of a practice growth diagnostic. And um, let me move to that slide. So when you're looking at yourself and you're trying to make a determination and trying to make what's going on with your practice, there's really three elements of a practice growth diagnostic. Number one is looking at the four cornerstones of growth, what's your profitability, what's your team and staffing like, what's your time management skills like, and what's your client development. Those four core areas are absolutely crucial to allow you to grow your firm. It's kind of what Joe had said earlier, you may be board certified or double board certified, but if you're not clear on how to manage your time, if you're not clear on how to hire and manage people, if you're not clear on how to client develop and recruit and bring on the right clients and price that kind of work, I don't care how many certifications you have, you're going to have a miserable life and a miserable practice. Number two is uh, a DISC assessment. And this, once again, kind of like Joe, I thought this was voodoo. But a DISC assessment allows us to look at how you prefer the world to work. And it's usually talking about um, your strengths and really how to design a practice around your strengths. And it really goes to um, looking at some of the fundamental ways that you can redesign and refocus your personal time around things that you're naturally gifted and you naturally prefer to have occur for you. And until you realize that, it's kind of like an athlete that doesn't realize that they should be playing quarterback. They may be playing center, they may be playing wide receiver, sometimes they're playing quarterback, but they're playing all these different roles and they're not playing in their strengths. And consequently, all they're doing is, is suffering and going through a lot of abuse because they're not focused on that. And number three is having a conversation with one of our uh, one of our practice advisors or one of our client service directors about what they hear and see about your practice. Because you can't see it, you're blind to it. And a lot of times your team won't point it out to you. So my recommendation is if you're thinking about this and you're intrigued about this, is to um, invest um, a, a modest amount. It's probably less than uh, most of you charge for your your uh, billable hour, which is an investment of $295 into the practice growth diagnostic. Um, so, Michael, if you could, why don't you move to the next slide for me? And how you do that is really you can go to the Atticus Advantage website and just click Let's Get Started. And that will give you the opportunity to go ahead and register and um, schedule a practice growth diagnostic with uh, one of our folks who can walk you through that. Now, that would be my recommendation. If you're ready to get started, that's what you want to do. Now, in the future, um, you know, Joe, I want to thank you again, and I will give people an opportunity to ask you questions in a second. But in the future, those of you that are participating in these uh, Attic Advantage webinars. We're going to do three more. Um, May 9th, we're going to do one called Beat the Email Bully, Five Strategies to Control Your Inbox, and that'll be at noon Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we're going to do another Lessons Learned, which is going to have some brilliant practitioner like Joe, but nowhere near as brilliant as Joe, I'm sure, uh, talk about the lessons they've learned, and that'll be June 13th. And then I'll be leading uh, one of my favorite topics, 
which is called the 10 Big Lies of Stop Practice Growth. And I'll be doing that one June 27th. And it's one of my favorite workshops. Um, I mean, favorite webinars or conversations to have. And upcoming workshops, for those of you that are checking us out, uh, Double Your Revenue, which will be June 15th in Orlando. And then How to Build Your Law Firm for Sale will be following that June 16th in Orlando. And both of those are really focused on the double your revenue, just straight up, how do you double your firm's revenue? If you're doing a half a million, how do you go to a million? If you're doing five million, how do you go to 10 million? And how to build your law firm for sale, focusing on the eight core value drivers that a buyer looks for in purchasing a law firm. And that's really what that workshop's about. And then we have the upcoming practice growth programs that uh, we have one starting in April in Orlando another one starting in San Francisco, which will be the West Coast program. And then this week, we're starting a Dominate Your Market program for estate planning and elder law lawyers. So if, if you're interested in any of these programs, just pop us an email, hello at atticusadvantage.com, and we can uh, give you the qualification information and talk about how to apply. Um, with that, um, Michael, why don't you tell them how to ask questions, and we'll give people the opportunity to talk to Joe about anything they would like. Sure. Once again, if you, you can use the chat function on your GoToWebinar dashboard to send a message uh, to me, the event organizer. If you'd like that question to remain anonymous, please indicate so, so that I don't read your name aloud. You can also click the hand icon to indicate you have a question or a comment, and we'll call on you. And when we do, we'll unmute you so that you can be heard. Um, I do have a question um, and comment typed in uh, by uh, Douglas. Douglas, if it's okay, I actually want to uh, unmute you and have you ask these questions. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do that right now and you could be heard by everybody. So Doug, you were asking about the future of uh, trial lawyers, specifically personal injury and, and some hybrid law firm questions. Can you elaborate on that? Okay, Doug may be having some audio problems. So I'll read his questions aloud for him here. Um, how about the future of trial lawyers, specifically personal injury, consolidation, uh, personal injury becoming a commodity handled by mega law firms, or do boutique personal law injury firms have a, have a place? Um, Joe, I'll let you respond to that. Then uh, I'm going to take my swing at it, then I'll let, let you take a swing at it if you're interested. Yeah, um, yeah. I think, yeah, I, I, I think that uh, if you're a trial lawyer, there's always going to be a place for good to great trial lawyers. However, I really think that you have to examine your business model today and appreciate how you get work in the door. And the thing that will drive more consolidation of trial lawyers and consolidation of law firms will be their ability to bring in business and their ability to niche. So if you're a general automobile accident firm, um, nothing will probably get your attention more so than self-driving cars. Because if you're carrying let's say if you've got a hundred cases uh, typically most small solo practice auto accident I mean in, in plaintiff firms about 70 percent of those cases are going to be auto accidents so if you're sitting here looking at the newspaper and going huh what does uber self-driving cars have to do with me and what's google's self-driving car have to do with me and what does apple have to do with me um, I would say that probably if as soon as those self-driving cars are able to hit the road, that you're probably in the next 10 to 15 years post the implementation of self-driving cars, you'll probably see the elimination of a lot of automobile accident cases out there. So you want to be taking a step back as a PI guy or plaintiff guy, which I did 10 years of, and ask yourself, what's the trend in the future? Kind of what Joe did around the real estate. You've got you to take a step back and ask yourself, okay, we're – where is technology commoditizing me and impacting my practice? And where do I see the opportunities for growth for my skill set? Not necessarily the type of cases that you do, but your skill set. Joe, what do you think? Well, back when I first started practicing law, we were I was a trial lawyer, car wrecks and medical malpractice and all that, and in a small firm in a small town. And what I've noticed in over 20 years now of practicing is that the smaller your town, the more general your practice can be and it has to be. Um, the larger the town, the smaller your niche has to be. You have to be laser focused. Um, so now I, I'm in Orlando, uh, Central Florida, fairly large market. 
we have the Morgan and Morgan uh, of the world, you know, the 500 pound gorilla personal injury firms, but I also have friends who are in smaller firms of, of anywhere from two to 10 lawyers um, that do personal injury uh, work and medical malpractice work, and they do extremely well um, because number one, they don't have to feed that advertising beast of television and radio marketing uh, daily like the, the huge firms are having to do. Um, and they've all cut out niches for themselves. They, they, ha they get referral marketing from other attorneys mostly uh, and from doctors, and they, take, they generally take the more complicated cases that are not the slam dunks. Um, so uh, that's, they, they, they survive on smaller staff, smaller marketing budget. Um, in niche cases, they're usually the ones with the big uh, meals, as I'll call them. Uh, and I, I use the term endearingly because I'm, I'm a meal too in some parts of my practice. Um, but they take those cases on and uh, then they get a reputation for, oh, well, they will take the, you know, the brain injury baby case uh, from a federal military hospital overseas. That's the only cases that they'll take um, or something like that. They, they build that niche and they become the go-to firm, not just in their town, but worldwide, my, and, and, I, and I, the reason I say the, the bad baby case from the military hospital is because my law firm I started working with 20 years ago in a small town in North Carolina, um, the, the lawyer who handled malpractice, medical malpractice there, has a reputation now uh, of that's the only kind of case he takes worldwide, um, a federal claims case like that. So. He built that niche, and he knows it. He's got his experts. He's, he knows exactly what he's going to do wherever in the world he gets that case, and he goes in and does it. I have a, a, a distant cousin who is a trial lawyer who specializes in petroleum um, and environmental contamination of drinking water in small communities like mobile home parks, uh, well water, and, 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 and small subdivisions in unincorporated areas of counties. And he travels around the world and has some, uh, holds some of the records for some of the largest jury verdicts in those cases. I'm talking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. But he built a niche as well. So there is a place for the small trial uh, uh, attorney's firm, uh, but yes, you have to find that niche of what you're good at because that's the only way that you can do anything and do it well and do it fast enough and make enough money and scare the, the defendants enough that they go, oh no, here comes that guy and and we know him from other cases around the country and, and I think that's another way that the, the small trial attorney firms will will last. I think it's perfect. I think it's a great analysis because what you're going to see is greater hyper hyper specialization and hyper niching, niching. And just like Joe said, nat statewide, regionally, and maybe even worldwide. So you're going to look for what is that that injury niche more so than um, that geographic niche. So that's well, that, what you're going to see. Yeah, and Go that ahead. goes back to what we were saying, knowing what your ideal client is. Uh, if you don't know what your ideal client is, then it's very hard to find that niche. Um, and then you get to you get to the point where it's like, okay, I only accept these clients on these cases. You know, mesothelioma from this year and this year to that to that, and that's all I'm going to take. Um, anybody else, we refer out to this other guy, and we've worked out a deal with this other firm that that's we'll refer it all to them, and they'll we'll we'll work out some fee over there for that. But that's how you that's how you survive. Got it. So, Michael, we're at the top of the hour, and what I'd like to do is go ahead and respect Joe's time and uh, call the webinar to a close. And Joe, just want to thank you again, bud. I, I greatly appreciate I know how busy you are. I know how valuable your time is. And I hope the people that attended today's webinar can um, appreciate the wisdom and insight that you're offering from the battle scars that you've earned on, you know, the, on building a firm that really is unique and in, in, in itself an innovative firm. So I just want to thank you. I just really appreciate it. Really appreciate what you contribute and what you bring to the, bring to 
um, the Atticus community, to my life, and also to the legal community at large. So thank you, but I really appreciate it. Well, thank you guys, too. I want to thank Atticus, because without you guys, we wouldn't be where we are today. Thank you. I, I greatly appreciate it. Michael, I think we're done for today. Um, unfortunately, we only got one question in, um, and I'll take ownership of me running over on that, just because I, I find Joe fascinating. So with that, everybody, thank you for joining us. I look forward to you on the next Atticus Advantage call. Bye.